Good afternoon. Our first item of business today is portfolio questions. And we start with question number one. Is this yeah. Question number one from Stuart McMillan. Thank you very much, presenting officer. To ask the Scottish Government what support it provides to companies selling products that improve energy efficiency and tackle climate change. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, I think the, the, maybe the microphones need to be turned up, but uh, Cabinet Secretary, if you can continue in a loud voice. The Scottish Government provides support to companies through our enterprise agencies. For instance, Scottish Enterprise work with businesses to understand the business opportunities of low carbon products and services and provide support with product service development where appropriate. The Scottish Government also supports the Sustainable Energy Supply Chain Programme via the Energy Saving Trust and Resource Efficient Scotland. And that supports businesses across Scotland to help build capacity and aid in maximising their share of spend from various Scottish and UK government programmes. Stuart McMillan. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that reply. And two businesses in my constituency, one of whom the Minister for Business, Innovation and Energy met a couple of weeks ago, have various products and services to improve energy efficiency in buildings across the country. Now, what assistance is actually provided to businesses to help them fully test their products, to get them to market, which could have a beneficial effect in terms of the environment, the economy and also job creation? Cabinet Secretary. Well, a wide range of services as I indicated, are available to companies through the enterprise agencies and indeed universities to support their innovation journey from initial concept development to market launch. Uh, and the support ranges from expert advisory services, support to raise investment, grant funding to develop new products and invest in R&D, uh, and including, for instance, Smart Scotland, which provides grants to small to medium enterprises based in Scotland. Uh, the grant helps the business undertake technical feasibility studies and research and development projects that have a commercial endpoint. Information on the full range of services and contact information is provided on the Scottish Enterprise website. Claire Hawkey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Minister what efforts the UK Government have made to seek the opinion of the Scottish Government regarding the Each Home Counts review and the improved standards framework for installation of energy efficiency products, particularly in light of the hundreds of consumers in Scotland who continue to suffer financial hardship as a result of issues with the UK Government's previous Green Deal in initiative. Cabinet Secretary. Well, um, the Scottish Government has uh, long held the view that the UK Government does need to strengthen uh, their consumer protection frameworks to ensure that customers are well protected. Um, so we therefore welcome the Each Home Counts review when first announced with officials meeting with Dr Bonfield to share best practice and offer areas and example of where things needed to be improved. We recognise the recommendations from the review is really just the start of the process uh, and that further details will need to be developed and we are carefully considering the review's recommendations as part of the development of Scotland's energy efficiency programme. Um, we'll continue to liaise with UK government to better understand how they're building on the recommendations of the report and ensuring that proposals for improving consumer protection are fully implemented. Alexander Burnett. Thank you. Uh, companies should be properly supported not only to make products that help tackle climate change, but also to help transport them in a greener and more low carbon way. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary if new plans for low emission zones outlined in, outlined in the programme for government will also include urban consolidation hubs for goods vehicles, given transport emissions have not fallen under this SNP government? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, that is one of the things that we are consulting on. Um, the member may uh, be aware that I think on the 9th of September, uh, I think I'm right in saying that was the date we launched the consultation on low emission zones, um, and that includes uh, reference to precisely the issue that uh, the member is raising. Low emission zones, of course, are, are something that will be developed um, in a conversation with local authorities, and for many local authorities, uh, that may look like an attractive option, um, but at this stage, we are not mandating uh, um, specific um, uh, 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 frameworks for low emission zones. That is something that will be developed over time, but I would invite the member to look at that consultation, uh, and he or he may wish to advise others to input to that on that specific issue. And Louise MacDonald. The Secretary will be aware of widespread concern in the North East about the First Minister's decision to wind up the Energy Jobs Task Force after she attends their final meeting today. I wonder in that context if she can tell us what new initiatives the Scottish Government will take to support and encourage 
oil and gas service companies to provide their experience and knowledge of engineering, of construction, of commissioning and of maintenance to projects such as the Murray Offshore Wind Project and other large projects uh, designed to uh, uh, cha tackle climate change and which really need that expertise coming uh, from the existing North Sea industries. It's quite a broad question, but if the Minister could <laughs> succinctly answer um, her I think I would struggle to bring that into my own portfolio remit, but I, uh, I'm, I'm aware from some of my previous uh, portfolio responsibilities and fair work skills and training that the aspects, some of the aspects that the member is uh, raising there um, uh, would be very germane to that. Um, and uh, I think if he uh, wished to have a further conversation in a much more detailed way, um, then either uh, my colleague Paul Wheelhouse or Keith Brown would be uh, only too happy to oblige him. Thank you. Question number two, Colin Beattie. To ask the Scottish Government how its targets on climate change and sustainable development are supported through renewable energy projects such as the turbines in the Pentland Firth. Cabinet Secretary. Well, of course, Scotland is a world leader in tackling climate change. We've made sustained progress against ambitious statutory targets and we're bringing forward new legislation to ensure we maintain this leading position. Um, we know that a variety of low carbon generating capacity will be required by 2050 in order to achieve our binding climate change targets. Our support for innovative renewable energy projects such as the Maygen Tidal Array in the Pentland Firth, which is the uh, first large-scale array of its type in the world is just one illustration of our commitment to building a modern, integrated, low-carbon energy system. Colin Beattie. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Can the, can the Cabinet Secretary outline what support the Scottish Government is giving to sustainable and renewable initiatives in my own constituency of Midlothian North and Musselburgh? Cabinet Secretary. Since 2008, um, 986 awards uh, have been made across Scotland through the Climate Challenge Fund that covers 622 communities. Um, in Midlothian, Northern, North and Musselburgh, the Climate Challenge Fund has awarded a total of £176,000 to five different projects. Um, and through our Low Carbon Infrastructure Transition Programme, we've provided early advice to a number of projects within this constituency area. However, commercial confidentiality prevents me from providing details at this point. It is the aim of the programme, however, to publish all information when available. Donald Cameron. Thank you. And can I refer to renewable energy in my register of interest? In relation to the Scottish Government's updated target to end the sale of petrol and diesel vehicles by 2032, can the Cabinet Secretary clarify if the Scottish Government has made any initial assessment of the energy capacity required to meet this target and what proportion of that will come from renewable energy sources? Secretary. That work is currently ongoing. Um, we hope to be in a position to be able to give further advice in that area in the, I would want to say near future, but I'm looking at my colleague, the Transport Minister, to ascertain whether or not he wants me to say near future <laughs> or, or not. Um, but that is, that, is a, that is a question, of course, that uh, a number of people will want uh, an answer to, and it is one in which we are uh, doing a great deal of work. And Gail Ross. To ask the Scottish Government what representations it will make to the UK Government over the failure to award a contract for deference to the major tidal development in the Pentland Firth. Secretary. Um, while the announcement about the result of the second uh, allocation round was disappointing uh, for the tidal industry, um, I, I don't, I'm not sure it came as a surprise. The, the, the way the scheme is structured and designed um, does mean that innovative projects are always going to lose out in favour of bigger players and more mature uh, technologies. Um, um, that is why, um, as a government, we're continuing to press the UK to commit to a fairer system in this area uh, that offers early stage technologies the chance to replicate the impressive cost reductions that we are currently seeing in offshore wind. Thank you. Question number three, Annie Wells. Thank you, presiding officer. To ask the Scottish Government what support it gives to initiatives that aim to make Glasgow more environmentally friendly. Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government recognises the importance of the environment and its contribution to the quality of life of our communities, as well as Scotland's international image and reputation. The Scottish Government supports delivery of local environmental quality through its establishment of policy frameworks, <coughs> supporting tools and funding to local authorities and other organisations. Annie Wills. 
I am also pleased to see that an inquiry into air quality has been launched by the Environment Committee and the Scottish Government made a number of commitments last week as part of its climate change bill. However, three streets in the city were recently named as the most polluted in the country, with a number of schools breaching the 150 metre safe zone. In line with the comments from British Lung Foundation Scotland this week regarding the need for the Scottish Government to ensure that councils improve pollution monitoring, particularly outside schools and urban areas, and in line with one of our own plans, what action will the Minister take to ensure that greater transparency and the recording of data by local authorities? Cabinet Secretary. Well, local authorities are uh, the responsible authorities um, uh, in, in respect of uh, air quality in their own areas. And uh, it, it is, of course, an issue which is of concern not just to Glasgow, but to a number of other uh, um, uh, urban areas. I am aware of uh, the streets uh, that um, are, are in that uh, list. I understand a number of them, however, is likely to be mitigated as, the, as time goes by because of the construction of new motorway. There are a couple of streets left where there are uh, some very particular problems. I'm also conscious of uh, the uh, issue around schools, about which there has been considerable publicity um, this week. Um, there is a, a, a deal of work to be done there, um, although, again, in terms of the actual measurements, I think we we'll look for local authorities to be considering uh, how best they can get that information uh, um, brought in. We, we are introducing an air quality fund to support local authorities uh, with the delivery of air quality action plan transport-based mitigation, and I would hope that local authorities will have a look at the availability of that. Um, and obviously, we will have to work with commercial and bus sectors as well in, in respect of their own vehicles. I mean, there are a very, great many things that can be done. Um, uh, and uh, um, I very much hope that uh, at Glasgow uh, will be taking up on some of the available offers that there are. And Bruce Crawford. Uh, thank you, President Officer. An interesting question raised by Annie Wells. Uh, but I wonder what impact does the Cabinet Secretary expect that the doubling of the funding for active travel will have on Glasgow, indeed other major cities, including my own constituency city of Stirling. Well, the doubled funding is basically going to allow us to expand our programme of building segregated and, by that method, attractive cycle and walking routes in our major cities um, and uh, create environmentally friendly places for people uh, to enjoy. Um, we are also uh, supporting work on the creation of a long distance cycle and walking route, which I know will be of great interest to, uh, to many. Increased funding will enable us to ensure that the encouragement and support people need to enjoy the new routes is in place, um, such as uh, Smarter Choice, Smarter Places programme, Cycle Friendly Communities, and perhaps more importantly, cycle training. Um, some members may be aware that I got on a bicycle for the first time in more decades than I care to remember recently. Uh, and it did occur to me that as well as training uh, teenagers how to cycle uh, uh, safely, that perhaps returner cyclists need a bit of focus as well. David Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer. <clears throat> the Cabinet Secretary will be well aware that air pollution in Glasgow and the rest of Scotland kills 2,500 people each year. Does the Cabinet Secretary share my view that the solution is clear of a four-point plan? We need to support the creation of more low-emission zones. We need to ramp up investment in active travel, as we've just heard, introduce bus regulation and make 20 mile an hour default speed limit in cities. A plan that will tackle climate change, boost active lifestyles and help the economy. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree? Well, 20 mile per hour limits are a, are a matter for local authorities to consider and I know that, for example, Edinburgh has already um, brought them in in a number of different areas. Um, I can't speak for every single city, but uh, um, uh, no doubt there uh, is consideration being given to them. Yes, uh, low emission zones, as the member will be aware from the programme for government, uh, um, are something uh, to which this government is very uh, committed. Um, the, we were already committed to introducing the first one by 2018, but what we want to do uh, now is raise that ambition to uh, committing to uh, low emission zones in the four biggest cities by 2020 and where evidence supports them in other air quality management areas by 2023. Uh, um, so, the, the, as you will have 
the, the member will have heard me refer to the consultation on low emission zones earlier, which will contain within it a, a discussion about a number of the sorts of things that he has, has already raised in his question and that will be uh, important to, uh, to consider. Um, uh, I'm not sure I want to add anything more to active travel than I did uh, from my, my previous uh, answer. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Question number four, Mary Fee. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how its newly announced innovation fund will impact on air pollution and climate change targets in West Scotland. Cabinet Secretary. Um, one of the most important stages of innovation is demonstrating your technology or business model commercially. And of course, we've already had a question which referred to that in a different way. Um, the new funding will be used to focus on innovative low carbon energy projects building on the low carbon infrastructure transition programme. One of the key application requirements for the Phase 2 fund will be to demonstrate an anticipated carbon reduction against business as usual, which in many cases is gas. In Phase 1, the Low Carbon Infrastructure Transition Programme supported five innovative low carbon capital projects in the west of Scotland. Um, all new funding will be made available through open and fair funding inv invitations announced against specific low carbon criteria. Maybe. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? As we know, the cost of air pollution is too high for our environment and for our health, with around 3,000 deaths per year attributed to air pollution. Does the Minister not agree with me that cutting air passenger duty in the hope of increasing air travel will do nothing to meet the objectives of the Scottish Government to reduce emissions that pollute our air? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the entire climate change plan, which is... Uh, uh, um, currently in development will be finalised uh, early in uh, 2018, uh, fully takes into account the impact of air passenger duty and balances it across uh, all of the sectors. Um, Scotland is one of the world's leaders on climate change um, and I, I think we have demonstrated our capacity uh, to, to manage that uh, across all sectors and we will continue to do that. Ivan McKee. Uh, does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that it is vital Scotland continues to take a global lead on tackling climate change? And not only is this important for the environment, but by taking a lead on innovation will be hugely beneficial for our economy. Cab Secretary. Um, well, uh, certainly I would agree on the first point. I've made reference to it uh, in, in a couple of answers already that Scotland is a, uh, already a, a global leader on climate change. Um, it is important for the environment, but it's equally important uh, uh, that, uh, that the economy um, uh, work in, in, uh, in concert with that. And innovation has, uh, has long been one of Scotland's strengths. So I think it's incredibly important that we build on that historic uh, strength and encourage innovation where there is a focus on commercial viability, because that's key to Scotland's continuing economic success. Um, we've already got a strong record of achievement in low carbon uh, innovation um, and the innovation of fun, uh, fund announced in last week's programme for government um, means I think that we can look forward to further collaboration between the public sector, the private sector and academia to continue to maximise this advantage for Scotland's communities. Maurice Corey. <clears throat> Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, can the Cabinet Secretary tell me how many electric ch vehicle charging points will be required to meet the government's target of phasing out new petrol and diesel cars by the year 2032, and how many will be put into place with the Innovation Fund? Cabinet Secretary. The work is being done at the moment with stakeholders to establish what that network will require to look like in order to achieve the ambition that we have set out. Um, and uh, uh, when there is a finalised figure, no doubt that will be made public. Question number five, Willie Rennie. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what assessment it has made of the amount of plastic nurdles on beaches in North East Fife. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, don't smile. Nurdles are small plastic pellets about the size of a lentil that are produced by industry to then be used in the manufacture of plastic goods. And I dare say Willie Rennie um, uh, met with and attended there. the lobby by Greenpeace that perhaps was where he, uh, like me, um, discovered the existence of these. They make their way into our seas and onto our shores by spillages occurring when they are handled or transported by business. Um, and we unfortunately don't collect data on the total number or weight of plastic nurdles on beaches in North East Fife. One can imagine how difficult that would be given their size. Um, surveys are undertaken by volunteers. 
Willie Rennie. Uh, Ruby Bay Beach in North East Fife is polluted by hundreds of thousands of these plastic beads. But Fife is not alone. It's estimated that about three quarters of beaches in the UK are polluted, which pose a risk to wildlife and the environment. Now, Operation Clean Sweep works with industry to cut the spillage of nurdles, but not every company handling this plastic is participating. Will the Minister consider legislation to ensure that every company does participate in future? Well, I would never want to rule anything out, um, uh, although I'm not sure how practical it would be just uh, um, as a superficial response. And I'm happy to discuss with the member uh, if that's a route he thinks would be helpful. He is absolutely right, however, to flag up the very serious nature, the extent of marine litter and particularly of plastics in our ocean, um, which is why we gave some considerable focus to that in the programme for government. Thank you very much. That concludes our section on environment, climate change and land reform. We now move on to questions on rural economy and connectivity. Question number one, Monica Lennon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when the Minister for Transport and the Islands last met representatives of Stagecoach and First Group and what was discussed. Ca uh, Minister, ca sorry, Cabinet Secretary Hamza Youssef. Not definitely, Minister, uh, Presiding Officer. Uh, I last met with representatives of Stagecoach on the 7th of August at the Bus Stakeholders Group. Uh, and representatives of First Group on the 11th of September, just on Monday past, where a number of issues were discussed from bus to rail policy and much in between. Monica Lennon. I thank the Minister for that answer. As the Minister might be aware, at his previous meetings with First Group and Stagecoach, the ones of the 28th and 30th of March this year, um, they became part of the growing list of Scottish Government ministerial meetings, which under FOI we know have not been minuted. Given the ongoing issues around transparency at the heart of the Scottish Government and it's such important issues relating to the forthcoming Transport Bill, which will likely have been discussed at those meetings, can the Minister provide further explanation as to the reasons why no minutes were taken and were minutes taken at your recent meetings? Minister. Being lectured by a supporter of North Lanarkshire and Labour about transparency is like being lectured by Donald Trump over responsible Twitter usage. It is a pathetic attack uh, to make uh, if she wants an idea of what was discussed, of course, I'd be more than happy to write to her. As I've said, it's bus policy, where we have a shared agenda, of course, to see an increase in bus patronage as opposed to a decline. In terms of the meetings that she discussed, in terms of introductory meetings, they are just that. They are a, a, an opportunity for us to get to know each other, to understand, of course, the basic issues that are troubling the bus sector and what the government can do to help to rectify some of that. So if she wants an explanation of each meeting, what was discussed, of course she can write to me and I'll be happy to provide. And I'm sure that would be substantiated uh, by the first group, uh, by first group uh, and by stagecoach. Uh, and I'm more than happy uh, to do that. I'm sure the minister meant to strike a slightly more humorous tone than it came across, but I would just encourage all members to be courteous to each other across the chamber. Angus MacDonald. Thanks, uh, President Officer. On a constructive note, can I ask the Minister if he can explain how the Scottish Government is planning on providing local transport authorities with improved options to influence the provision of bus services in their area to better meet local users' needs? Minister. I thank the Member for a constructive question. The constructive answer would be, of course, that we look forward to bringing forward a, a transport bill. Uh, part of that will be a bus element. The consultation on that has been launched today, and they will consult on a number of issues, whether it's local franchising, municipally uh, owned bus companies, enhanced partnership, open data, all of that will give more powers to local authorities to be able to shape bus services uh, that help their communities. And on top of that, of course, we'll continue our support in terms of the BSOC grant, our support, of course, for the National Concessionary Travel Scheme and look to extend that. Uh, and all in all, hope to drive up patronage uh, on buses, which has been declining, uh, not for years, but I'm afraid uh, for decades. Jamie Green. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, the Minister will no doubt be aware of the impact that peak time congestion uh, is having on commuters using buses and coaches. Can I ask if he has any plans to extend uh, bus and coach priority to other parts of the trunk road network, given the perceived success of what's happening on the M90, and indeed for his views on usage of the hard shoulder and motorways during peak time congestion? Minister. I'm more than happy to take, again, constructive suggestions such as that and have a look at what we can do more on the trunk road network. What I would say is when bus operators speak to me about congestion, it's usually at the local level. So Glasgow in the west of Scotland, perhaps, 
uh, with some of the worst congestion uh, is that we see across the country. So what more can be done in that regard is really up to local authorities, the bus operator, but of course having a conversation with government about how we can help to assist that and low emission zones might be part of that conversation. So I'm more than happy to take away some of the suggestions that have been made and if the member wishes to write, me, write to me with more detail, I'll explore what more can be done in the trunk road network. And we are doing some work actually uh, on that with uh, Transport Scotland, uh, but if, ha if he has more specific suggestions, I will examine them, explore them, but I would highlight that at a local level, uh, there is a, there is, that is where we need to tackle uh, congestion in order to, as I say, reverse the tra trajectory of decline of bus patronage. Lee MacArthur. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I wonder, in, perhaps in future discussions with the stagecoach, um, uh, Hamza Youssef might be uh, willing to take up the issue of a reduction in services in the far north of Scotland in Caithness. Not only is this having an impact on travellers within the Caithness area, but it's disrupting connections with onward ferry journeys to and from my Orkney constituency. And as a result, I think can only result in uh, fewer people taking on the bus and using this as an option. Minister. Yeah. That is an issue that was raised uh, with me in my recent uh, uh, visit to Orkney. Of course, we were delighted at that time to announce the reduction of, of ferry fares uh, to the mainland. But of course, the point was made that when people come and, and use that Scrabs or Stromness route in particular, uh, ensuring that there's enough bus services to take them uh, for the length of their journey uh, thereafter. So of course, I'm more than happy to raise that uh, with Stagecoach. I should say, of course, they are a commercial entity uh, and, and therefore uh, that decision is a commercial decision for the uh, bus operator to make. Uh, if he would like to make that uh, representation to Stagecoach, I would advise him, of course, to do so if he hasn't already done so. Uh, but I'm more than happy to do it in my next meeting uh, with Stagecoach. Question number two, Fulton McGregor. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it is taking to ensure that fibre broadband is installed in new housing developments. Cabinet <coughs> Secretary Fergus Ewing. Uh, from 1st January this year, amendments to the Building Scotland Regulations 2004 set a new standard for in-building physical infrastructure for high-speed electronic communications networks, thus enabling easier installation of fibre at any time. I also understand that OpenReach now offer fibre to the premises connectivity to developments of 30 properties or more, as well as a tariff proposal for smaller housing developments, presiding officer. For homes delivered under the Affordable Housing Supply Programme, the Scottish Government issued guidance to local authorities and registered social landlords advising that homes should include ducting to help future-proof access to internet and broadband services where possible. Finally, in new build developments, where there is commercial demand for super-fast broadband, we expect this will be delivered commercially without the need for public funding. Fulton McGregor. Yeah, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. The vast majority of my constituency has now had fibre broadband installed, which is welcome. However, there are thousands of new houses planned for Cope Bridge and Chryson, and already there are hundreds of households who do not have fast broadband and won't for many years to come. I welcome the response I've already had, but will the Cabinet Secretary work with the Housing Minister to ensure that OpenReach and housing developers are working together to install fibre broadband as part of any new build programmes? Cabinet Secretary. Well, yes, we, we are working together with the <gasps> private sector. We, uh, we have good relations uh, with the, the main players who, with whom we engage regularly. Um, the building warrant requirement for new homes is a step forward. It's a good thing, but of course that doesn't affect existing homes. We have been able to extend access to broadband uh, to 750,000 homes and premises as a result of our contracts with BT, but there's more work to be done. Uh, and I can assure the member and other members who are interested in this uh, that we uh, are very much share the objectives of ensuring that such access is universally available. Question three has not been lodged. Question four, Alexander Burnett. Uh, thank you, President. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what changes it plans to the next BT contract for 100% access to superfast broadband by 2021. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, President Officer, I should make clear that contrary to the premise of the question, we are making no assumptions about who will win the contracts to deliver our 100% commitment, the R100 contracts, neither BT nor anyone else. Indeed, we are seeking to ensure competition within the procurement process. Alexander Burnett. 
Uh, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary on that uh, point on procurement uh, noted? Uh, too often, residents are told that their postcode has access to superfast broadband and are therefore included in the coverage statistics. However, in reality, often do not. An example of this would be Kerga Village in my constituency of Aberdeenshire West, where the superfast fibre cable passes their houses on the very road they sit on, but residents do not have access to this cable. So will the Scottish Government revise their definitions of fibre enabled and have access to fibre in their new contract, uh, to whoever may it go to, uh, to ensure that it is a more accurate representation of accessibility to superfast broadband? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, the supplementary question was certainly well disguised by the original question, uh, which is of an entirely general nature. But of course, if the member cares to write to me about this specific instance, then of course I'll look into it. Uh, that said, however, I would remind the member that responsibility for regulation about the mode of introduction of access of superfast broadband rests entirely with the UK government under Schedule 5 of the Scotland Act. And therefore, the power to regulate what must be done rests entirely in that place, which is sad because they have not taken the outside-in approach to ensure that rural areas get access to broadband uh, as quickly as urban areas. That hasn't happened because the UK government hasn't chosen to use the regulatory powers which it possesses and could have used, like other countries, for precisely that purpose. Question five, Bruce Crawford. So, to ask the Scottish Government, in light of it being Scottish Food and Drink Fortnight, what advice it has on supporting the food and drink industry and what action it recommends the public takes as part of the fortnight. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, President Officer, Scotland's food and drink sector is one of our great success stories. Food and Drink Fortnight aims to encourage producers and suppliers to promote Scottish produce and pride in our farmers, fishermen, crofters, distillers and others who make our great food and drink. This year, the key message is change one thing, whereby everybody, whatever their connection to the industry, is encouraged to change one thing about their relationship with Scottish food and drink to make a positive contribution to the industry. Bruce Crawford. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his response. But will he confirm that the growth of our food and drink sector in constituencies like mine has been supported in recent years through grants from the EU? Last week I visited Katie Rogers Artisan Dairy in Stirlingshire, who received funding in June for new equipment to help expand our business. Should we leave the EU? Can he advise if the UK Government has guaranteed to provide financial support for innovative food and drink businesses like this in the future? And the Cabinet Secretary should know I have committed to eating more of Scotland's fantastic dairy produce as part of the fortnight. I hope the Minister will agree with me that that shouldn't be much of a hardship for me. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, that's a, a one excellent thing that Mr Crawford has adopted. And, uh, uh, having had a, a look at Katie Rogers' website, I would recommend everybody to visit the website and visit the premises, which I believe are around or near Balfron, uh, and uh, consist of uh, high-quality yogurt products. So that's the advertorial part of the answer. Uh, to answer the substantive question, presiding officer, the UK government has confirmed that contracts entered into at the point of UK exit will be guaranteed. However, that's only 18 months away. What happens after that? We do not know in respect of this particular form of grant finance, which is so important, especially to small businesses such as Mr Crawford's constituents one. Therefore, my advice to Mr Gove is get on with the day job. Get on with the work of sorting out how we are going to continue to help our food and drink industry grow with the grants and the financial assistance that we've come to expect to be available under the EU. Question number six, Patrick Harvey. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government if it will provide an update on whether it plans to legislate for the mandatory installation of CCTV in abattoirs to, men to monitor animal welfare. Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government has already recommended the installation of CCTV as best practice in the monitoring of animals at the time of killing. And I'm advised that an estimated 95% of animals are slaughtered in plants where CCTV has already been installed, presiding officer, voluntarily. As announced in the programme for government, the Scottish Government will consult uh, in 2017 to 18 on the introduction of compulsory video recording of slaughter abattoirs 
in Scotland to aid enforcement of welfare requirements by Abattoir Management and Food Standards Scotland. Current advice concluded that CCTV does not by itself prevent welfare failures or secure welfare compliance. We will continue to monitor animal welfare at time of slaughter through the presence of Food Standards Scotland veterinary and inspection staff in all approved slaughterhouses. Patrick Harvey. Thank you. I was uh, very pleased to see the commitment to consult on mandatory installation of CCTV in the programme for government because while we, we may disagree on other issues from time to time, I'm sure Mr Ewing and I, neither of us would want it to be said that he was falling behind the aforementioned Mr Gove on progress uh, on this issue. Uh, he says, uh, understandably, that CCTV doesn't in itself uh, ensure compliance with welfare standards and shouldn't be a, a substitute uh, for good management. But can he tell us that the consultation will very clearly set out how mandatory installation of CCTV could form a part of good management uh, of these facilities uh, and that the consultation will be on the question of how, not whether, it should be done. Cabinet Secretary. Um, well, I think we do sh share this, the same approach of having the highest uh, uh, animal welfare standards. Uh, and uh, the answer I gave reflects the fact that the expert committee the, fa the Farm Animal Welfare Committee, who provide independent scientific advice to all GB administrations, uh, 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 have provided advice that CCTV cannot act as a substitute for direct oversight by management or veterinarians. And further, this group of experts, as I think Patrick Harvey does know, uh, that by itself, CCTV does not prevent welfare failures or secure welfare compliance. So that uh, expert committee did not recommend that CCTV be made a legal requirement. Instead, they promoted that they recommended that CCTV is promoted by assurance scheme operators. Uh, I've been very pleased to see that uh, Quality Meat Scotland has updated its processor assurance scheme standards to add a new animal welfare section to apply to slaughters, and that might be of interest to the many members that have raised this important issue in the chamber. So far as the consultation is concerned, I think it's right that consultation set out matters factually, in detail, comprehensively, and give the, those who are interested, and particularly those who have a particular interest in the industry and also animal welfare, uh, all of the facts, uh, and set out these dispassionately and in a mutual fashion. I think that's the right way to do this, because in having consultations, we don't prejudge the outcome. We want to see the responses to those consultations before we decide what to do. Question eight, Kate Forbes. To ask the Scottish Government how it is supporting the rural, rural economy in that well-known island of Skye, Loch Haber <laughs> and Badenoch. Cabinet Secretary. Well, I'm very familiar with the island uh, of Skye. And of course, the... <laughs> I'm sure all members are, signing off, sir. Uh, uh, nearly a one that's not uh, aware of this uh, fact. Anyhow, the Scottish Government is committed to supporting sustainable economic growth across Sky, Loch Haber and Badenoch with a range of actions through our enterprise agencies as well as direct activities such as supporting the GFG Alliance's purchase of the former Rio Tinto Alcan aluminium smelting plant in Fort William. It's early days yet, I've stressed that, uh, uh, presiding officer, but this predicted investment will add one billion pounds to the local economy over the next decade. Kate Forbes. The Cabinet Secretary will agree with me that uh, broadband will be transformational in the rural economy and I warmly welcome the commitment in the programme for government to put rural Scotland at the front of the queue in the R100 rollout. Is the Scottish Government committed to working with community broadband groups, for example, Lochielnet and Badenoch Broadband, in that process? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, we, we are committed to working in this uh, way uh, and uh, the uh, community-led broadband networks have had a positive impact, some of them supported by Community Broadband Scotland and indeed Loch, Loch is an excellent example having connected, I believe, 390 premises and benefited from 91,500 of CBS funding. Um, just the, the other thing I would say is that uh, we do, of course, uh, want to and are committed in our manifesto to providing access through our R100 programme to every home and business premise in Scotland by the end of this parliamentary term. Peter, Peter Chapman. 
Thank you, President Officer, and I remind the Chamber of my Register of Interest. Given that LFAST is such an important part of supporting these remote areas that Kate Forbes speaks about, what is the Scottish Government plans to do with the savings that, from LFA, LFAST parachute payment option? Cabinet Secretary. Um, right, well, I'm not sure that there will be any savings from LFAST. Perhaps what Mr Chapman is is meaning is that because the current intention is that LFAS payments according to EU rules are to be paid uh, for the forthcoming year at 80% of the previous entitlement, what happens to the remaining 20%? Uh, this was something that we considered very carefully and quite rightly so, uh, and it's simply contrary to EU rules that we could have devised a backdoor route to making up for that 20% loss directly to the LFAS recipients. That would have been a clear contravention and would simply have resulted uh, in disallowance on quite a major scale. I would also say, and I presume Mr Chapman knows this, but the European Parliament has urged the Commission to reconsider the introduction of the 80% Alfas this year and is ar urging that that be next year. And I believe that the Commission is considering that. And of course, as soon as we get any further up information about that, uh, uh, we will report back to Parliament. Were that to be the case, I would have to find £13 million from my portfolio to make up that payment. I would certainly want to do my damnedest if that's not an unparliamentary term, presiding officer, to do just that. Rhoda Grant. Thank you, presiding officer. The cabinet secretary will be aware that both Rochaber and Sky have enjoyed busy tourist seasons this year, but that has brought its own problems um, with the lack of uh, infrastructure to cope with them. The single track roads and Sky leading to iconic att attractions are at gridlock, as is the A82 A running through Fort William. Can I ask what he's going to do to improve that essential infrastructure to allow tourists to enjoy the sites and locals to go about their business? Cabinet Secretary. I well, uh, Kate, Kate Forbes has made me aware of this, this important issue through her assiduous work on this uh, over the summer and meeting with the local groups. And I'm pleased to hear that Rhoda Grant shares these, uh, these interests. Uh, and plainly, you know, in some ways in Scotland, we are now a victim of our success. We have become so popular in tourism, uh, uh, thanks to the leadership of Visit Scotland, assisted from time to time by the occasional Minister for Tourism, uh, that things have gone extremely well. And now, of course, the pressures are the pressures coming from that success. Now, of course, don't forget that the value of that money coming into the economy is great, and extending the shoulder season is really helping uh, with, event, with uh, 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 things like the NC500 uh, to provide a, a step change in the contribution that tourism is making to the Highland economy. So I think overall, this is a great thing. But I do know that a lot of effort is being made locally by local businesses and people in Sky, and Kate is, uh, Forbes is involved in all of that, as well as by the Highland Council. And I've discussed this informally with Margaret Davidson to tackle these problems of success, particularly at some of the sites which are extremely busy, as Rhoda Grant reasonably points out at the end of single track roads. So a lot of work has been done behind the scenes to see what in practice can be done between the public and private sector working together. But uh, I'm delighted that tourism is doing so well in Scotland. Thank the Cabinet Secretary and the Ministers and all the members. That concludes